Hi, this is MXUX. I'm going to do a quick uh, video here on Faraday Future and the uh, SPAC PS, the PASC. This is about the CEO they have in Asia, and the progress report on what's going on, some notes from the CEA, uh, CEO in uh, USA, and some other notes on the car. I do not think this SPAC is getting enough coverage. The price is down in April from 15 to to $12. It was down 2% today. That's April 2021. Let's go to the slides. The first thing I want to talk about is the they have a dual home market strategy at Faraday, which I don't think it's anything new. I mean, GM has, you know, assets there and so forth, but this is this is a strategy that they've come up with there, uh, and and their dual home markets are going to be China and the United States. And uh, Br uh, Britfeld is the global CEO, and uh, Chris Chen here is CEO of China. And um, I guess it's going to operate like a conglomerate. I'm going to go into this a little. Let me just go through these details here. Um, Chris has a very impressive resume. He's got 20, 20 years in autos. He has worked for the China assets of all these companies, Ford, Mazda, Cherry, Jaguar, Land Rover. I think his last position was an executive, executive uh, vice president. Um, and uh, I believe that was at age 39. He was the youngest person to head a, uh, a joint venture, a U.S.-China joint venture in China. Uh, so that Chris is experience-wise, he's gone through the whole gamut in 20 years, and um, I put him right up there uh, with his probably with his car knowledge is is uh, up there with uh, you know like a Sandy Monroe level and and. Breakfield's level as well. Um, he studied design, auto design, and manufacturing um, at Wuhan University. And Wuhan University is uh, one of the, the uh, four uh, elite universities uh, from the Republican period in China. And it's presently like has the highest rating for uh, us in America, in North America. Um, it would be, um, I would imagine, Ivy League. I don't know that that matters because uh, his uh, um, achievements speak for themselves. Now, one interesting thing about Chris, and you know, I was reading up on him and I could not find my notes, but uh, Chris is not a CCP uh, uh, member. However, He's been chosen. They have a special advisory board that works with the uh, CCP in China. And uh, this board acts like the American equivalent would be like the Better Business Association. Or uh, you could do Better Business Association. I have down here Auto Lobby slash Auto Lobby. And these are experts, and they advise the CCP on legislation. Um, they might propose legislation. Hardly any of the legislation they propose is enacted. Uh, however, uh, much like a lobbying group in the United States, um, they, they provide all the uh, expertise and input to the lawmakers. Um, and perhaps uh, in this sense, a less biased in a less biased manner. And many many of the inputs they give to uh, the CCP, um, they end up in um, legislation. And and the CCP does this in agriculture and manufacturing, autos. So it's um, it's quite an honor to be uh, chosen as one of these experts. And this is the rub here. You have to. You don't apply for <laughs> to be one of these guys. You are chosen uh, because of your uh, your expertise and your uh, you know the people recognizing that you are uh, people in the CCP. In other words, and, and, and in other ways, ex uh, recognizing your expertise. 
And Chris has been chosen as the uh, auto, uh, at least one of the auto representatives uh, to this body. And, uh, you know, and I, I'm sorry I missed my notes. I apologize to everybody in China. I know you exactly, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The point I'm trying to make, this is a very prestigious uh, appointment to be tapped for uh, by the CCP. So he's very well regretted in China and, uh, you know, by the industry, obviously, and by the CCP. And uh, he is youthful for his experience. And so he's going to have his thumb on the market there, uh, the uh, prime uh, buyers, you know, the 25 to 40 market, whatever. Uh, you know, he's obviously got a ton of local connections, having worked for 20 years in autos. And um, he's a really high achiever. He, he, you know, looking at it from a rec recruiting standpoint, really strong candidate. Very strong candidate. And he is... Uh, I feel he's definitely ready to take this next step to the CEO role. And I'll tell you, you know, his vitality and his, um, I, I'm, you know, this is a great choice, I think. This shows a lot of leadership from Breitfeld and the board. Um, and he's going to, I have, do believe he's going to do a great job uh, for Faraday in Asia. And I think people are overlooking this whole strategy and this whole China market. This FF91 is going to do fantastic in China, it's my opinion. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Okay, now that Faraday is, is um, pursuing the two home market strategy. And as I said, you know, uh, a lot of companies have assets in China and so forth. I, I do believe, and there's no really strong, clear explanation on this, but you know, uh, the psycholinguistics imply that, um, you know, they're going to have a home. They, they consider China a home market, not an export market. And they con they consider the United States a home market and not an export market. Of course, they're going to build the first uh, FF91s in the United States. And, you know, they're likely to, to uh, send them uh, all over the world, I would think. Um, the production is going to start uh, within a year uh, I believe, and I have a slide on this later, so don't quote me, within a year on the FF91 after the SPAC closes and within two years uh, in China. But anyway, this is an interesting way to invest in China with with a stock that's, that's listed, uh, okay, on, on the NASDAQ versus an ADR. And, you know, there are pluses and minuses to using an ADR, but this, this is a um, NYSE listed stock. So this is, this is, I think this is a unique, unique, unique way to play the China market uh, for U.S. investors. Um, and again, I have here work around for potential trade issues. Um, Again, the CEO is uh, on very good terms with the CCP, and he's a very competent executive. He knows how business operates there and so forth. Um, now, they're going to be using, Faraday is going to be using both Asia and China for manufacturing techniques and, uh, and expertise, and um, they're going to be uh, especially building their lower price models, and they have one, I believe, uh, this is 180. I believe the next one is between 90 and 70. And below that, the next model is um, uh, between uh, 60 and about 40K. And uh, this is following, uh, you know, the Tesla game, game plan here. And these are basically, the, the FF91 is, uh, you know, like the Learjet private jet concept. And then it then it moves down to a luxury SUV, and then it moves down into, like, um, a family SUV. Um, so they're going to they're, they're gonna, – these the manufacturers in China, I don't know if you heard Sandy Monroe lately, he said the Chinese manufacturers are going to be the biggest threat to the U.S. auto manufacturers because they are – they've got it down so good. So there you go. you got Asia. you got also have uh, operations in uh, Korea, uh, manufacturing operations. Um, 
they're also going to tap China for funding, I believe, through the, uh, and I mentioned this in my last video, through the uh, the Chinese operation. You know, Geely is, is gigantic over there, and they have, uh, you know, uh, technical stretching out into the banking and finance community, and they have their own finances. And also, uh, if you look at the CCP that stepped in with NEO to promote the uh, production of um, EVs in China because they do have a goal of, you know, of course the uh, air pollution and everything they're they're really attacking it uh, uh, intensely. Anyway, uh, they're going to be building in the actual China market for the China cars, so they're not going to have an import problem or trade problems are going to be sidestepped for that. And I think. Um, I think they're probably going to export these lower cost models to the United States. And because it's an American company, I mean, we'll, it'll be interesting to see what the trade deal is on that. And um, so anyway, I think the whole concept uh, of, because, um, you know, a, a Chinese CEO isn't necessarily uh, going to be, I, I, I mean, I don't know could do very well, but I mean, the Chinese, let's face it, the Chinese market in the manufacturing sector is different from the from the American market and the American manufacturing sector, and I think splitting it up between two CEOs is a great idea, and uh, I think it's, uh, I, I think this whole model is good, you know, the stock listing and so forth. Anyway, so the team is, uh, oh, I misspelled that, well, the team is YT, who, you know, I, I just watched a speech from YT that he did in English. This guy, he's quite a visionary. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I'm very impressed with YT. And, um, you know, he's been uh, shuttered off into the background here, but I'm sure he's going to be very, uh, very active in the experience, uh, the personal experience inside this car. Then you got Breitfeld, which is just a dynamite executive from BMW who brought that great car to market in three months, in uh, 36 months. And then you got Chen here in China, who is a real crackerjack. So they've, I think they've got a really good top management team there. They got LA Design. They're going to have LA Design and China Manufacturing. Sounds like Apple all over again. I don't want to talk about the Apple car. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, where's the SPAC now? Well, let's just talk about the FF91 and, and the SPAC, you know. This, this car, and you can see this interior here, how it is really, this is a nice car. I mean, I was worried, I, I mean, I looked at the Mercedes-Benz ESQ and I was waiting for that to come out. And if you compare the interior of this car to the Mercedes, I gotta tell you, this, this car is just so much nicer in my opinion. And in, in a lot of different ways, in the space and the, uh, the concept of the screens and the, the design and the aesthetics, I mean, I'll tell you, uh, I think it's a great car. Anyway, uh, the U.S. CEO drove from uh, L.A. to Las Vegas. And anyway, the point was, uh, the point he was trying to make was that, you know, after he did it, he had over 100 miles of range less. You know how they state the range like uh uh, Tesla will state 350 miles and then, you know, you get 340 or whatever. This car, the range stated is the true range, okay? Uh, and that was the point Breitfeld was making. But anyway, they drove this car, you know, from L.A. to Vegas. So this is no pusher, okay? Uh, they're they're doing, doing updates presently, and I'm sure, you know, with, with G5, of course, coming online in China much more quickly than the United States, but certainly in the United States as well, G5 is, is going to be, connectivity is going to be a big part of this. And that's what the upgrade's probably all about. I discovered that this, uh, this is a pre-production vehicle. This is not an alpha, it's not a beta, it's a PPV. Now, I don't know if this has to be retested, but this car has already been crash tested in 2017. And, you know, that puts them ready to go on the production line. If that's true, if they've got the certification from NHTSA, 
anyway, um, so uh, between April and June 2021, so any any day now, this is going to be NY or a NASDAQ, I should have down here listed, uh, uh, Fife, F-I-F-E, and um, it's going to be released to the public in April or June of 2022. And so within this, probably this month, it's going to be listed. And one year later, it's going to be out for sale to the public, which after I learned that this already has been crash tested, that's, that seems to me totally doable, especially with Breitfeld in charge. And they have an existing factory. The numbers they're going to put out, I don't know. But, you know, if they work 24-7, three shifts, if they get to that point, you know. Anyway, it's a $180,000 car. They have 14000 pre-orders with $5,000 deposits, I believe. Anyway, uh, they're using a uh, direct sales model. And they're going to have 20 retail showrooms globally. So it's going to be the, uh, you know, Tesla direct sales model. And, uh, you know, on those sales, you know, they have 14K. I don't believe they've released the number that have uh, put down the $5,000 deposit. I want to correct that. And I also want to say that this is going to be NASDAQ listed. <laughs> I got some, got some, I've been rushing to get this out. I do apologize. I hope you find my errors charming and endearing. Uh, next slide. Now, this this comes from the late part of an interview with Sandy Monroe, and I was just looking at my notes, and you guys might want to verify all this for yourself, but I'm going to give you what, what I got out of this interview. Um, and this is uh, uh, Cartfield, uh, Renfield uh, talking with Sandy Monroe. He said the car is going to be a platform. Okay, he said the sensor seat will, suite will be installed for self-driving, and it's going to be an extensive sensor suite that, with all the sensors that are needed, and I'm sure that they're probably going to have LiDAR and everything else on it, and, and they're all going to be hidden in the body, in the trim. They're not going to be, you know, you know, typical design, but the point is, he said that the self-driving computer, now they were working on their own self-driving system, and I don't know if they were using Mobileye or what they were using or if they had in-house, uh, completely in-house then. But this is what he stated. Now, I may have misunderstood him, but as I understand it, uh, he said the, the, the car's going to be a platform. It's going to have the, you know, the harness of the sensors in it. He said the self-driving computer will be removable the hardware, and it will be upgradable. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I believe that's what he said. So they're going to have, you know, a standard set of connections there or whatever, and this is going to be enabled to be upgraded. So I don't know. I don't know if this is anything that Tesla's ever thought of, but I think it's a Pretty, uh, pretty great idea. He says a lot of interesting things about self-driving systems. He says they're going to be heavily regulated. He said there's only going to be one or two that are going to pass the regulation to full self-driving. But this whole idea of, and I don't know, if, this is according to my notes. Please do your own DD and watch this interview. But uh, he said it would be removable and upgradable, and I thought that was groundbreaking. That's... Uh, that's great because, you know, as the technology upgrades, you know, the sensors will be in place. You just upgrade the, you know, whatever, the processors and so forth. Uh, and I guess the car operating system will be separate using the uh, uh, Faraday Future app, which uh, links to the phone. And really, it's just kind of like casting your phone screen on the, and your contacts and so forth on the car. And I think it's location driven where you're sitting that particular area will have that phone uh, that that person's info leak uh, linked uh, anyway these are minor details it's just the idea of having that whole experience come in and I believe they have 12 or 14 screens in this car anyway 
Um, YT was years ahead on the concept of this car experience. I mean, this, this car should have come out, you know, I don't know, four or five years ago, whatever. Uh, at least four years ago, let's say. You know, this whole idea of the user experience, I mean, uh, everyone is concerned now. Well, the drivetrain, the 0 to 60, you know, the battery range, all this stuff. I think this is is, is becoming more and more irrelevant. I think people are just glazing over. You know, with an ICE engine, there were all these technical improvements that could be done to valves and pistons and so on and so forth. With these electric cars, I mean, you know, you have some drivetrain uh, changes you can do, battery ranges and battery types and battery cooling systems. But uh, more, more and more, they're becoming like an appliance. I don't want to say a washing machine, but, you know, when you buy a washing machine, you don't care about the motor. You, you know, you, you care about the user experience, the user interface, you know, how the knobs are, what the, what the programs are to wash. You, you get what I'm saying? I think cars are getting like this, too. And I think Elon Musk realizes this, and, uh, and he's done good with the car controls and stuff. And I think he's just starting to bring the... Um, the whole entertainment uh, and uh, the personal experience into the car. I don't think he's quite done that yet, and I think YT beat him to the punch on that. Anyway, uh, all this has been uh, brought to fruition by having this um, a large computer on board and a, and a great battery supply for the computer. So anyway, I think YT was ahead of the ahead of the game on that, and I think. With the refresh Cartland Brettfeld is doing to this and, and, and the G5 connectivity, I don't know. This thing is even going to be better. And, you know, the 12 screens in it. I was just looking at a, a review of the new Ferrari, and they've got about 12 screens in that, but they're about 2 inches by 2 inches. But uh, they kind of copied the Faraday Future uh, a, a bit. But, you know, the Faraday Future also has the heads-up display. I mean, I think this is a really great car, of course, for $180,000. But, anyway, it's... It, I, I think I was I was concerned about the Mercedes ESQ. I think it blows the Mercedes ESQ out of the water. And then I had a clip I was going to include it, but I didn't. They have the um, uh, the SUV, the Mercedes SUV, which is the um, you know their um, uh, limousine brand. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, you know uh, the one uh, uh, what's his name Rokawer. Uh, anyway, the wrapper rides around it. Anyway, the point is, that thing was like a hunk of junk compared to this, uh, to the FF91. And uh, that was a specially outfitted Mercedes SUV. Not even, not even close. Not even close. I mean, they put a little pinstriping on it, some badging. I mean, this, this car is going to blow a lot of these cars out of the water. I mean, especially in the luxury end. I mean, really. And you look at something like the newer ones. Ugh, give me a break. Lucid? Come on. Anyway. That's it. So this stock is uh, coming to fruition. Probably this month, this stock is going to be listed on the exchange. Like I said, it's down from 15 to $12 this month. It's down 2% today. company. I think they're doing all the right things. All right, this is MXUX. Thanks for watching.